Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the day two and a half, whatever we are in DEF CON. I've kind of lost track. Uh, I'm Null. Uh, Crash went to get more beer for us, so I think that's a good thing. So round of applause for Crash when he gets back in. <laughs> Over to my right here, we have I Like Sheep. My left, we have R Snake and Hacks are the Matrix. And last but not least, we have the Hoff, who will be doing a special interpretive dance for us today on keyboards. Okay. I like sheep. Yeah, we, it's actually been established regularly. Thank you for admitting in public, though. I really like sheep. You do, and you know this is what happens when you don't show up for the prep meeting. Woo! <laughs> Thank you, Crash. Crash. Yeah. So you should know that this isn't going to be the most serious talk. So uh, take it for what you will. So uh, I've been asked to read this by Chris. Uh, Thanks to a certain journalist who didn't interview me correctly, but to inaccurately what I said at Black Hat, I'm not speaking today because I enjoy making my mortgage payments. And his voice is, in fact, totally fucked. So he could be laying at the pool at Caesars, enjoying some naked girls. Only one of the screens is. That's it. Oh, all right. It's cool. So instead, um, we were talking with Chris and I were talking a couple weeks ago, and on his blog, he often posts poetry. And he claims that he can do it live, and most of his posts come up in about 15 minutes or so. So today, Chris isn't going to talk at all. Instead, well, he's going to heckle the rest of us via text. We're calling it the DEF CON Poetry Jam. And the theme today is failure. There's been a lot of talk about protecting data, keeping it protected. And really, we came to a conclusion as we were talking on the phone a few weeks ago that failure really isn't an option in this industry. In fact, it's actually inevitable. So the theme today is pretty much get over it. You're going to get fucked, whether you're a researcher, whether you're a commercial, you know, corporate security person, whether you're a manufacturer of security software. So the best plan is to plan for failure and move on from there. So I was going to talk about some other stuff today. But really, earlier today, for those of you who haven't heard, the Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority sued some speakers who were supposed to be speaking tomorrow because they felt that their research was a violation of assorted federal codes, including the Computer Crimes and Abuse Act. So <clears throat> they got their restraining order, and the speakers have pulled out their talk. Yet the MBTA missed a couple of key points, like 7,000 CDs that have been handed to all of the attendees here with the speaker's slides on them. <laughs> hey, does, does anybody remember Cisco Gate? What? Does anybody remember Cisco Gate? Yeah. So, you know, the, the one lesson I think people should have taken away from that is that once you turn your presentation over to someone else, you can't really reel it back in, no matter how many pages you tear out of a book or how many CDs you have shredded. It's on BitTorrent. Yes. So, and actually, as part of, actually, I'll get back to that in a second. So, as part of the paperwork that the MBTA filed with the courts in Massachusetts, they included several exhibits that are actually publicly accessible and publicly available to anyone who wants them. You can see where this is going. Two of the exhibits they included were, one, the presentation. So it's now in the public domain. And two, an academic style white paper that it describes in more detail than the slides did the nature of the research and the attacks they did. So if you know someone who has access to online legal documents, just have a little chat with them. And you can see the slides if you lost your CD or you want the white paper. It's out there. It's in the public domain. And it's freely accessible. So uh, all I can say to the MBTA is there are about Seven to 8,000 people here, and you've now convinced three people they're not allowed to talk about it. But, well, the rest of us are. I'm not going to go into a lot of details because we have a lot of other stuff going on, but, you know. Is it your slide now? Or is no, it okay. okay. But, you know, the rest of us can talk about it. Um, take a look at the slides. And meanwhile, well, MBTA, you're today full of fail. Next, we have uh, our snake to talk about his stuff. Thank you. Thanks. 
sue him for it. Yeah. Hey, everybody. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, just kind of how we're, we're trying to solve problems um, that are kind of bleeding edge, they're really interesting, we're all really excited about them, but uh, we really haven't fixed anything. Uh, if you all noticed, like everything's still broken, people are still getting owned all over the place, the wireless networks, I mean, it happened like two or three times at this conference, not including the wall of shame and everything else, uh, wall of sheep, rather. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about authentication on the web and how it's totally broken and um, how there's a whole bunch of vendors out there selling stuff that doesn't work. Um, and uh, I'm going to tell you why you're going to pay for it anyway, which um, is pretty lame. Um, so let's get on with it. So second factor auth, I'm, how many people have one in their pocket right now? One of these like four? This is a security conference? Really? Okay. Really? Oh, okay. Is it because you just didn't bring them? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so um, this is my favorite way to get around it. Please mail us your username, password, and token. Um, there are users out there right now who will fall for this. Uh, I've actually met them. Uh, you go to an eBay Live conference, you meet some average human beings. You know, they're not like us. They they'll do pretty much anything you ask them to do. Um, in fact, uh, I like this picture. I uh, know it's the back. Why am I showing a picture of the back? Because if you say enter the token number, that's the number they're going to type in. They don't know to flip it around and look at the other side. That one's the one changing. That's too hard. <clears throat> So banks won't federate. They, they say, like, we're not going to work with one another. We're not going to work with the industry. Uh, and without banks, no one wants to do whole federation concept. Um, and the reason why that's kind of a big deal is, um, you know, people are going to have to carry around multiple tokens. And why, why am I going to have, like, five tokens to do all of my banking? All, the banks won't even talk to one another. And the reason for that is they're worried that, um, you know, one uh, central repository is going to get compromised, which it may or may not. But I'm, I think, you know, we've done a fairly good job of securing, like, CAs and stuff. So I think we could get around that. But it's a, it's a sort of a least common denominator. Like, whichever one's the, the least uh, secure is the one that they're going to go after. So if you want to hack some kind of lame little porn site that happens to use federated tokens, uh, they can also let you get into the bank. Well, that turns out to be a problem. So uh, people lose them. Uh, they type them in wrong. Um, they uh, put, put them in backwards, like I said. Um, it's just it, it hurts the ability for consumers to interact quickly with websites. Um, and consumers don't really understand the value of the tokens themselves, so they'll give them, they'll give people their keychains and walk away with them, and just all kinds of stuff. Uh, event, event-based tokens. If you've seen them, the little press, the little buttons on them. Kids love to press those things, and they get out of sync pretty quick. You have them in your purse, your wallet. They get pressed, just kind of sitting around, uh, so they don't work. Um, just kind of a pain in the butt. So really terrible for consumers. Uh, time critical functions, um, and I ran into one guy from the U.S. Mint, uh, and I was talking to him about this exact topic, and he said he carries 13 around at the same time. 13. Can anyone beat that? Is there anybody who has more than that? Right. Okay. Good. We have a record. So if anyone beats that, I'd be curious to hear it. Uh, it's just ridiculous, right? I mean, how do you carry that around at the same time? You know, of course he's got a ha he's got a bag full of keychains to log in, right? So uh, the other ones like bank TLDs, I I've, I've talked a little bit about it on my blog, but I, I really just, I'm super annoyed at this whole concept. Why have an entire TLD just for, you know, people are going to say, oh, well, if it's not a bank TLD, I know it's a phishing site. Well, um, the problem is if, there, if you tell people that you need to go, like, log into this bank, um, you know, uh, it, it turns out that people actually have to read the URL bar for that to work, and fishers don't even use domains a lot of time. They use IP addresses. Um, and consumers fall for it all the time. So I don't see why that's going to change anything, um, but I, I could be wrong. Not to mention um, you're, you're going to have to have this huge migration plan to move everything over. Um, everyone's going to say, well, I'm not a bank, but I want to be secure too. I do transactions. I'm a real, you know, you know some gigantic real, um, um, what am I trying to say? You know what I'm talking about. Um, um, real, real estate. No, that's not right. Uh, retailer. Thank you. Um, so mom and pa's are going to thank you. Ah, I'm a little hungover. It was late night. You guys hear about PDP? No, really? No one got. No one heard about that. Wow. Go go read full disclosure. It's pretty interesting. It kept me up until 1:30 just reading that. <clears throat> no one knows it. Okay, so uh, PDP got compromised um, uh, a couple days ago. Um, we made it in full disclosure. Um, they put his personal docs, pictures of his uh, wife. Um, it's pretty nasty. So. Uh, uh, we don't know how it happened. Um, uh, it was Gmail. It may or may not be an exploit in Gmail. Uh, they're looking into it. 
Um, so basically, we're just building like another version of EV certs, um, another version of SSL, another version of all the same crappy authentication that really never told a user where they were to begin with. Um, people are going to fall for it in the same way they fell for everything else. So we haven't even slightly solved the phishing problem um, by using uh, bank TLDs. I think it's just a terrible idea. It'll never get implemented properly. We have a huge migration plan. It's just a bad, bad idea. Uh, people are going to do it anyway, uh, even though I tell them not to, but i just let you know ahead of time. So speaking of EV certs, uh, fishers don't use SSL. So it turns out that if they don't use EV certs, it works pretty much the same way. Um, they just they just don't implement it, and it magically doesn't do that. Um, it's pr prohibitively expensive for the small customers, you know, the little guys out there who do want the same authentication. So one thing's green, one thing's... It's, it's just a huge pain. <laughs> and uh, look for the locked messaging, which I'll show a little bit later. So this is Gridmark. <clears throat> this is uh, literally the, the worst-looking authentication flow I've ever seen in my life. Um, I see a lot of really bad implementations of authentication, but this one is particularly bad. So what you have to have is a password and a direction. So upper right, upper left, lower right, lower left. You just pick a direction and a password. So uh, if I were to pick, if my password were the letter, you know, the number zero, and I pick upper right, it would be, in this case, six. I can hardly see it. Um, so you, and then you type in six, and therefore, if someone was in the man in the middle, they wouldn't be able to tell what wait, your password is. Wait, 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 this is real? Yeah, yeah, I didn't make this you, up. You didn't make this no, up? No, 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 this is absolutely real, this exists. No, 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 no I didn't make this up. Um, but, <clears throat> so it, it gets worse. So here's a, a, a different implementation, same product. Um, it's using a two-digit series. I'm, I, it looks kind of secure, right? You're, you're like, wow, I wouldn't know what to do with that thing. It's awful. And consumers, I tried. I, it took me 15 minutes to log in the first time. I'm like, what am I doing? <clears throat> so um, this That's is just because you were waiting for the numbers to change. Yeah, no kidding. So what is it, CAPTCHA? What do I type? Um, so, uh, so this is my password. It looks pretty secure, right? Some s random string of digits. You know, you can't tell what it is. So I'm going to show you how to break it by hand. No, no, nothing up my sleeve. No calculators. You're going to do it by hand. So it turns out that this is just a, a couple of sets of digits, right? You just take them apart piece by piece, uh, and you say, okay, where's zero one? Well, that gave me two pieces of information. It gave me the direction, and it also gave me the first letter of my password, which is. Pound. How can you not see the letter that it's on? Come on, guys. Oh, you guys can't see it. That's right. It's. It, I'm sorry. I apologize to this side of the audience. You're still idiots. You picked over the wrong here. side of them to sit on. <laughs> it's the letter I. Come on. You got it. Can you see why it's the letter I? Because it's over the letter I. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's, right. there's a big purple circle. That, over that big there. purple <laughs> circle. That's I. Got it. Okay. You're gonna you're gonna get the next one. I promise. Now it's. Thank you. All right, all right. It's, it also turns out that the second letter of my password is... Thank you. All right. <clears throat> so the next one's more complicated. Um, it, it actually falls all over the place. Um, for some reason, this... Oh, I screwed it up now. What's that? Uh, I totally, totally blame Rich Mogul for this. <laughs> anyway, it falls all over the place, but it turns out that there's only one place that matches that direction, and that's... Uh, that's right there. So my password is ISSA, right. So you can do it by hand. Um, and it turns out that the longer your password is, the more secure you want to be, the easier is this, this is to break because you just you know, find that there's more places that it couldn't have been the other direction. Uh, so literally, you can do this by hand. Uh, I suggest you try it if you ever get uh, stuck in the man in the middle and you're like, oh my god, I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, just try to do it by hand. So that's total snake oil, and it's crap. I see this kind of stuff all the time. Um, so Psyche, uh, which is actually semi-implemented into Gridmark, by the way, um, is also um, a terrible security mechanism. So there's an MIT study, for those of you who don't know about it. Um, so people didn't even notice when their Psyche, their little image that was, uh, you know, it's an image of a puppy that they uploaded or whatever. Um, when, when it wasn't a picture of a puppy, uh, they, they still didn't notice. When you just kind of got rid of it, they still didn't notice. Uh, in fact, consumers were more confused by it than they were actually helped by it, it turns out. So it's just total snake oil. It doesn't do anything for security at all. Uh, and it's also uh, pretty vulnerable to man-in-the-middle attacks because if I know your, your, pa your username, which you gave me before, you know, that's why I know how to deliver you the site key password, or um, picture, rather, um, then, uh, I see, I'm totally hungover. I'm sorry. Ask him how long he spends on his hair every day. <laughs> <laughs> 
What's that? What's that? Oh, well, that kept me up all night. What are you talking about? <laughs> so ultimately, fishers can just say, I lost my password. What is that? <laughs> I like Goatsy. I, re I really hate this panel. I don't like any of these guys at all. All right. The hair thing really threw him. He doesn't know how to recover. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I got a I got a text message while I was sitting here. Um, yeah, hey, you want to come over to this other uh, speech? I'm like, I don't think I'll stay at this one. Thanks. Um, we appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Are you reconsidering that decision now? No, uh, I'm reconsidering. I really am. So, um, so, but anyway, all the sites are still vulnerable to all this other crap. So it doesn't really matter. I mean, so you have this a like, great authentication system that's super amazing, and you paid millions of dollars to implement it across your huge enterprise or whatever. But it doesn't matter. You're still vulnerable to everything else. Um, I mean, I, we do a lot of audits, and I really rarely find a site that's actually locked down. Uh, I mean, I'm sure they exist. I just no one's asked me to, to look at it. Um, I mean, this is Semantics website. They've got a cross-domain.xml file that's open. That's just uh, that's just sad. So, uh, like Paris Hilton, who can't spell, um, this is pretty useless. Yeah, that's not how you spell your. Um, so most enterprises, you know, they don't use any sort of email encryption. They, you know, encrypt their faxes. All their phones are all open. So physical security issues are just wide, wide, wide open um, it's for, for their clients when they're sending off. You know, here, log into this site or do this or whatever. All that stuff's wide in the clear. I'm sure you guys all know this stuff, but it's just we've never fixed any of this stuff. It's not done. Um, there's a very, very select few people out there who are doing this stuff, but uh, not enough to actually make a difference. Um, brute force detection is one of the kind of the weird pseudosciences of uh, the authentication world. Uh, not, not a lot of people talk about it, but there's like four different ways to do brute force, and um, maybe one of them is usually covered by sites who actually care about this stuff, uh, and that's vertic or, yeah, vertical uh, password checking. So it's like username, you know, password, the same username, different password, same username, different password, and so on. But it also works if you switch that up and say, you know, different, you know, Username, password, different username, same password, and so on. And then you can do horizontal or sorry, um, diagonal and then three-dimensional with different IP addresses and so on. You can mix it up. There's also credential-based uh, brute forcing, which really no one ever talks about. We actually do find it in the wild fairly regularly. Um, it's, uh, it's really bad. I mean, no one's fixed any of this stuff. There's a very, very few sites who are dealing with this stuff appropriately. And ultimately, it's a really hard problem. Um, they don't force strong passwords. There's no auto logout. I mean, everything is broken. You can log into anybody's account because they store the they store the credential in the database. They never wipe it out. It's a mess. Um, and we have downloads over HTTP still. I mean, people are downloading executables all the time. So, so you're going to end up using all this stuff anyway, even though I just told you not to. Um, and there's a reason for it. Um, so. There's this uh, kind of the bear run. You need to run faster than the guy standing next to you. You know, you don't need to outrun the bear. You just need to outrun this other guy thing. You know, which <laughs> he's here till Sunday, guys. Have the steak. So I actually really hate this analogy because it implies that that actually does anything for your security. Um, it, it really doesn't change anything. Um, so if you're running faster than the guy next to you, just use the same analogy, and he eventually gets eaten, who's the bear going to go after next? I mean, you're sitting right there. You're like, hey, that's my buddy. What are you doing? You know, you're still going to get eaten. Um, and it's just a matter of time. If you have, if you have one, so let's say there's two banks in the world, just to make this simple. And one bank is using this new cutting edge piece of security, and the other bank isn't. So the new cutting edge piece of security that actually isn't security at all, but it looks nice and fancy, um, is starting to reduce the amount of, of attacks over time because the bad guys just realize it's easier. I'm just going to ignore them. Sorry, I just can't deal with them. They're going to move over to the other guy, and, um, and it's going to look. Their fraud ratios are going to drop off. The other guys are going to get worse. And they're going to say, hey, look, you've got case studies to prove that this is working. Fraud drives or you know, all this fraud's dropping off. This other's going up. It's perfect. The other guy implements it. The same thing happens. This guy's fraud goes down over time or goes up over time because the bad guys move over and so on. So everyone thinks, hey, this is a great security product. It worked. And we have metrics to prove it. But in the end, the bad guys are just shifting around and just trying new exploits and uh, figuring out that their scripts just work differently on different pages. How are you doing, Hoff? Good. Um, oh, there we go. See, someone does love me. 
Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, so, um, so basically, just plan to fail because you're probably already doing it. Uh, I don't mean to hurt anyone's feelings, but there's a lot of crap out there, and I have to deal with it. And um, cheers. So it's pretty obvious that there's a lot of easy, dumb shit that still works really, really well. And for the next part, Larry and I are going to talk a bit about some stuff that's, eh, you know, it's basically taking attacks we've known about for years. It's going to be some wireless stuff. We have a demo and all sorts of things going along with it. Um, and to be honest, I, I don't care if you've got the biggest OD in the world. I don't need it. There's just so many other more effective, easily effective things that get the job done. So for this next section, we're going to go talk about building the perfect evil twin attack. And uh, we're going to do a combination of rogue access points and evil twins, and uh, just because we combined a bunch of our work stuff. <laughs> it is distracting. Yeah. Oh, it's the short. Yeah, the plane. The plane. Is he Jewish? Because uh, we can't be really. Well, anyway. <laughs> hey, don't you just want to grab Rich and make him tell you where the pot of gold is? <laughs> On that note, I'm going to switch over to Larry for a bit as he's going to talk about doing all sorts of wacky shit with access points that you wouldn't, well, <laughs> let's just say they're internally motivated. Wait, before, before he starts, I have, to, I have to make an announcement. I actually stopped drinking and one of my co-presenters just gave me a beer. So if the first person who can answer a, a funny question Rich is going to ask in a minute can have this beer. How many people think Dave Maynard sleeps with goats? Your hand was up first. You get the beer. <laughs> Enjoy it. There's a goat sperm in it. <laughs> and I do believe his answer was, who wouldn't? <laughs> <laughs> Sir, what you do on your own time is your own business. It takes all kinds. All right. So uh, Rich is going to be talking about hiding some uh, evil twin sort of uh, wireless access points. Um, I've got some creative ideas on uh, where to hide these things and um, how we can get back access to some of the data. So I had a little bit of inspiration for the uh, folks uh, for this stuff, and it was uh, RenderMan. Uh, he's probably up in the wireless village right now. Um, so RenderMan's first hack uh, appeared at ShmooCon 2005. Uh, was known as TeddyNet. Um, he walked around with a teddy bear on his back, which is rather unusual, or maybe not at a hacker convention. Well, not if you're a Japanese schoolgirl. Not if you're a Japanese schoolgirl. Yeah. So can you can you start drinking again, Dave? Because it, it would help. <laughs> so no one seemed to notice that. Uh... So this panel is also epically failing right now. Okay, so they're taking my slides away. Okay. So I can keep talking anyway. So no one seemed to notice that uh, RenderMan was walking around with this teddy bear. And every once in a while, an SSID would pop up called TeddyNet. <laughs> what is that saying? It's exactly model three. Fantastic. Little did you know, before Rich worked for Gartner, he, uh, he was actually the Teddy Ruxpin model as well. <laughs> I want to love you. <laughs> you can sit right there. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. So I thought about this, and I said, well, that's pretty neat. Hide an access point into something that seems rather innocuous. Uh, so he initially built this uh, to give to his one of his friends who had just had a little baby girl. And that, you know, that was the joke. You're going to provide her an access point, a teddy bear, for her to carry around. Well, so that's what he did. And he took it to ShmooCon to test. But I thought, well, I'm not going to find too many teddy bears in an office when I'm doing a penetration test or trying to, to own some companies. So he actually ended up coming with this, known as Evil Bastard. It's a broken APC UPS that remove, he removed the batteries from, um, added some wiring, put an access point in it, reused the existing Ethernet ports so that he can now plug this into the network. Looks like it's supposed to be there until the power goes out because now your PC shuts down because there's no batteries left. But it works. Works well. So I thought about this and I said, all right, so what can I do with this? But using a WRT54G is kind of large, so... Let's pick something a little smaller. Um, I've used the uh, Lafanera 
um, the phone, the original one, uh, with OpenWort installed. Uh, here it is out of its case. I am definitely not Jewish. Okay. Oh. So uh, when you take this out of the case, uh, remove what? the antenna, it's about the size of my wallet. So it's actually pretty small, and uh, we can actually fit this in some good stuff. However, we do have a problem. Part of my wanting to be able to hide these things is to keep the host device functional. So whatever we put this in, I want to make it continue to work. So it looks like it's supposed to be there. And we're not having people call the help desk saying, oh, my X doesn't work. Uh, can you come fix it? The technician comes out and finds my access point. I, don't, I want to avoid that. So part of the problem with the LaFanera was we only have one Ethernet port. So again, help desk calls. My device isn't functioning. Um, so in the long short of it, we need another couple of ports. So we're going to take a Netgear EN104 out of the case. Um, I've got some lines drawn on this for those of you that can see it. Um, take the Dremel to it, remove a bunch of traces, um, re-put them back on with jumper wire, make it a little bit smaller, take all the Ethernet ports off, and off we go. So we've got a couple of more challenges with hiding some of these rogues. Um, we want to make sure that, again, the host device is functional. Um, some of these things, we're not going to have a lot of size to deal with, uh, a lot of room to put these in. <laughs> okay. Is it something I said? Okay. Um, Potentially, uh, if we're in a more robust environment, we're going to have to deal with uh, network access control, um, but maybe not because some of these devices that we'll be inserting access points into um, don't necessarily support the client, so they're on an open segment that doesn't have NAC. We also need to find a sacrificial device, and depending on what it is, um, may be rather expensive on your budget, so you better be billing for time and materials. And we got a few other things, too. So we do end up needing to do some creative soldering in order to make some of these devices small. Um, we can actually uh, remove all the Ethernet ports, and I actually found out that I can't, so fail. Um, we can lay down the capacitors where we need, uh, trim the boards, jumper the bits we remove, and we can do both of this for La, La Fenera and the host as well. How much have you spent so far? A couple hundred bucks. You, you could do this with an iPhone. Yeah. But then you can't even. <laughs> but that's not nearly as much fun. The problem is, is that the uh, iPhone does not have an Ethernet port, so I'm plugging into an Ethernet jack somewhere and uh, adding a rogue access point and uh, grabbing data off of their network. You could do it with an EPC. Very true. Still much larger, and you'll see why. So, for my experience with this, one of the most difficult parts um, was the Ethernet ports. I figured when I started this, great, I'll just desolder the Ethernet port from the board, solder the wires directly to the board, and off I go. Well, what I failed to remember was that Ethernet ports are designed uh, uh, electrically isolated from the actual device so that if there's a stray voltage spike coming down the wire, it doesn't fry either your switch or the device. Yeah, and I wanted to redehain that because, you know, I want to keep some of the stuff. So the problem that I run into is now I'm taking apart the devices, soldering directly to the pins on the Ethernet jack, and uh, as my wife says, I end up looking like a dork because I spend a couple of hours wearing one of these. Wait, yeah. that's what made you look like a dork? <laughs> <laughs> well, that too. Okay, so one of the other problems is uh, finding power. So... <laughs> yes, yeah, so uh, technically you can do this on an iPhone when you leave it in a cab. <laughs> So one of the other things that's a challenge also is powering these access points and or the, the switch hub if we need it. Um, we both need five, 5 volts DC to power both of these. And again, I don't want it to go discovered for very, I want it to go undiscovered for quite some time. So I don't want to have someone walk up to a printer, for example, and see that 110 mains power plugged into the printer and also a wall wart because that's kind of unusual. And you know, someone who's a little bit more sophisticated if a tech is walking by, um, they'll note that well, that's kind of strange. That shouldn't be in that configuration and take a look at it, hopefully. So let's find power internally, tap from it, and, and deal with that. Now, we're not going to find matching voltage all the time, so we're going to have to build a small circuit to deal with that. Zener diode, and we're off. So once we've hidden it, um, Rich will get into some more about um, being able to retrieve some of your data. Um, in my instance, I'm doing it via Ethernet. I'm deploying it in a customer's network or I'm deploying it in some organization that um, I don't want them to find it. I'm never probably going to see this device again because you think it was a rush hiding this device. Yeah, now return to the scene of the crime and go get it. So I had a thought about getting the data back, 
And because I'm installing OpenWort on these devices, uh, it's all Linux based. So now I can take a cron job, run the cron job at say 3 a.m. to change my wireless settings so that it sets up a wireless access point that I know about and I can park out in front of the building, connect to it, pull my data off. Shut it back down after 10 minutes. Now ask your guys that monitor your wireless intrusion detection systems and your rogue access point detection to find that at 3 a.m. for 10 minutes. They're not going to be happy and you'll see why. So are you saying wireless IDS vendors like Airtight would not provide you any benefit here? I did not say that. Could you're you just, say you're, that? You're just going to drive your admins nuts because they're going to get it for 10 minutes every day. <laughs> so, yeah, it will pick it up. It's going to give them some pretty darn good ideas as to where it's going to be, but you're going to see why they're going to go nuts when you see where I'm hiding them. Are you hiding in their desk? What's that? Are you hiding it? Never mind. Am I hiding it in my ass? No. We'll get to that. <laughs> Don't give away the punchline. Yes. There you go, randomize the cron job too. But then again, I need to know when it's going to be there so that I can go back and collect the data. So I need to know what the randomization is. Now I'm sending, have it email me. Now I'm sending traffic from a device that shouldn't be emailing anyone outbound from the customer's network. They may pick up on that and now they have a device to know what to look for because it's coming from an IP address and can locate it via switch port. If I had an iPhone and didn't leave it in a cab, I could Guys, deal with that. Guys, we'll get to that. Yeah, so we'll get there. So now we have our requirements. <laughs> I'll see you later. <laughs> Here's my room key. <laughs> so what can we find in an office environment we can start hiding these rogue access points in? And it's now time to get more evil and more bastard. But remember, every time you hide a rogue, Homer eats a kitten. So printers. One of the most ubiquitous pieces of tech in uh, most office buildings. Um, I've seen a facility where they had a uh, printer overrun. They had three printers for every person in the building. <laughs> don't ask, I don't know. All right, so let's start in the beginning. The HP MIO. Okay, so yeah, looks pretty big. It looks like we should be able to fit both the devices in there. Um, there's one slight problem with this because where do you find these printers that support HP MIO? No, Quentin, you don't find it in that kind of storage. You find it in dead printer storage. So I found these printers at a customer site in storage. So unless you work for somebody that doesn't have a lot of money and maybe a community college, you probably have a bad time finding these devices. So we're going to fail on that one. That's the, that's, that is the uh, theme of this presentation after all. So let's uh, upgrade to the EIO. Great. Looks good. It's a little bit smaller. Um, we're going to have to get really creative with trimming and soldering and all that good stuff. Um, the problem is, is that EIO, the best I can tell, is based on PCI 3.0, which only delivers 3.3 volts, and we need 5. So now we have to you know, build circuit to increase 3.3 volts to 5 volts, and we don't have that, enough, that much space. So no luck there. <laughs> yeah, you want to hold this for me? <laughs> Are your hands clean? So what about external print servers? Yeah, well, these places, these are, you know, we can find these. But will it fit? Yeah, it looks like we've got some pretty good rock, luck. <laughs> well, I heard someone laughing, so now I have to look. I'm nervous. But you may be asking me, oh, Larry, these things are really old technology. Well, I took this picture six months ago. Um, it prints multi-part medical forms. Think about the type of stuff if we had a rogue access point in line in a hub that we could get off of this. Can you say identity theft? Paris Hilton's medical records? Paris Hilton? We already know what she's got. <laughs> <laughs> so now you may be noticing in that picture that there's a little sign up there, and yeah, it's the warning because it's in an area that's protected by FM200, which is fire suppression, because it's behind locked doors. Well, I've also seen these types of things in unsecured areas that print checks. Thank you. Okay, so what next? See anything interesting here that I might want to hide an access point in? The cocaine. The cocaine? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, that's ink toner. Never mind. <laughs> Whoa. Seriously, we're going to hold the... Never mind. All right, so what about multifunction devices? 
Sure, they've got Ethernet. Um, it's about the same as an EIO form factor. Uh, unfortunately, this printer is directly across the hall from my office, and I would have had an office full of mad people if I decided to take this out and start uh, soldering stuff to it. Have so the printer so you're saying that you weren't willing to sacrifice for this presentation? <sighs> I can only sacrifice so much. <laughs> start with a goat. Okay. What's that? Start with a goat? Start with a goat. Dave, can I borrow your goat? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you're not getting them back. Or Wash it out first. Pieces. Wash it out first. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> so now. <laughs> so now after, you know, we talked about grabbing print jobs from printers being in line with a hub, now we can also grab print jobs, copies sent over the network, scan documents over the network, faxes. You know, think about when you go to your office every day, the types of stuff you scan, fax, and print. That might be very useful to an attacker or me. What do you see here that we might want to hide a rogue access point in? Pretty Cl close. The clock. Not the clock. But that's a good opportunity because uh, some of the clocks that I've encountered are actually controlled centrally by time server, um, but not via Ethernet. So that would be interesting. I'd like Wait, to find you, those. You can buy an NTP clock? Pretty close. Pretty close. So yes, on this sign has a little box that converts serial to Ethernet. This one's really small, but the same manufacturer make ones that are about the same size as an HP MI, uh, EIO. Okay, that's probably a pretty good idea. So, how about here? Fire alarm panel. Yes, some of these fire alarm panels are Ethernet enabled. Um, not to mention that these switches are also um, fire rated powered by multiple sources of power, battery, generator, multiple lines for backup power. Ooh, okay, that's good. So my access point is going to stay up when there's a fire in the building. I like that. So I have to make a, a warning of advice. I don't condone that's this type of... a distraction. You're going to start a fire. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you know, either start a fire doing this or, again, messing with this fire type system puts people's lives in danger. And, uh, yeah, I, I'm not about that. But it's possible. So don't do this. What about here, besides the IBM servers? Liebert, potentially? Yeah. The exit sign? Climate control system, how's that? You say, Larry, it has a lock on it. Go talk to the guys in the Wi-Fi, uh, in the, the lockpick village. They'll make Swiss cheese out of it in about 30 seconds. What about here? The doctor. <laughs> we'll get to that. Yeah, time clock. Excellent. I've taken these photos off of eBay. Uh, the one on the right is a um, Kronos 4500 uh, time clock branded with ADP, the world's largest uh, payroll processing company. So what are the chances you're going to find this somewhere? Pretty good. The uh, Got plenty of room to hide stuff. Uh, the 4500 actually even has the optional model to have battery backup. Great. Now we know where we can get power from. The online available documentation uh, also instructs us on how to clone these. So if you need to replace one in the field, you take it off the wall, you clone the configuration to your new device, you put the new device back. Thanks. Made my job easy. So I also go to a lot of these. What do you see here besides maybe the Ethernet ports and the desk or the table? The lamp. I'm not listening to Dave anymore. How about the projector? This particular Sony model actually already has Wi-Fi built in. So maybe a wireless signal coming from this particular conference room might go unnoticed because they expect it to be here. What about here? In the Furby. This looks promising. What about here? Yeah, how about voice over IP telephone? Think about what you might want to record or listen to over that. Let's take a look at the inside. Oh, great. The phone that was sitting on my desk in that first slide, two Ethernet ports, right? We have one to subvert. We also have power, but it doesn't have a power brick. It gets power via power over Ethernet. So now you're going to ask what, Larry, power over Ethernet, uh, based on 802.3 AF, requires special signaling. You know, now you have to build a device that plugs in, you know, handles all that signaling to tell you what power you need and all that type of stuff. No. Let the phone do it. Grab it downstream. 
So we have another device that I'll be getting to in a second that uh, actually does that. So we have it do all the uh, power conversion, does all the uh, AF negotiation, and then we grab it 48 volts off the center diode, and then we split it for a center diode for ourselves. So now the next question is, Larry, those phones are in a secure area. You know, they're obviously in your, your office, you're there, or you lock your door when you leave. Well, what about keeping your guests happy? They show up to the facility, they walk in the front door, they meet the receptionist, they sit down. Yeah, guess what, there's a phone sitting right there on the table. What would it take for me to swap out, walk in and swap out that phone unnoticed? Now here's my favorite. Even this, three comm net jack, can turn into this. Standard size wall mount jack, wall mount box, with the LaFonera stuffed inside and it put back in front. So that uh, power for ethernet, uh, pulling the power is actually this device that we pulled power from, and I have this working at home. It's powered via power over Ethernet with an access point in a wall jack. <laughs> Dave, this is why you're going to drive your admins nuts, because they're expecting that that device to be there with stuff plugged into it and not it not being an access point, and it's stuffed in the wall. Ouch. So we've covered a bunch of office technology, hardwired stuff that you know, may be a little unusual. But how about putting an access point, an access point? <laughs> oh my god, that's as bad as tunneling DNS over DNS. <laughs> Is Dan Kaminsky in here? <laughs> oh my god, that's as bad as tunneling DNS over DNS. <laughs> okay, so just a few uh, that I encountered. Um, the Lucent Proxim Orinoco AP 1000 and 2000s. I actually saw these in a law school a couple months ago, still in use. So we probably get enough room to hide one in there. We've also got external power, good voltages. Um, Linksys WRT54G, you know, probably only going to find these in smaller businesses and those types of things, but, you know, smaller businesses have types of data that we may want. Um, I also looked at the Trapeze Thin AP, uh, belongs to my employer, has security screws, and someone borrowed my security bit set and didn't return it. So I wasn't about to take this into the shop and get the drill press out. Again, sorry, Dave, I can only sacrifice so much. Well, let me ask you a question. How, how, much, of, uh, how much of this presentation has your employer seen? All of it. So they were totally okay with you taking your office phone apart? No comment. <laughs> they didn't know about it until much later, so, oh well. All right, so conclusion, yeah, we've got plenty of stuff in an office we can hide things in, um, good places for APs, and you know, how many folks, how many of our admins monitoring wireless intrusion detection and rogue access point detection and potentially um, evil twin detection uh, are gonna find this type of stuff in a timely fashion? So let's think about this a little different, you know, just, to, just for fun, again, sort of along that um, evil twin type of attack. So let's use OpenWort, uh, the open source Linux distribution for the LaFanera, and create uh, WDS or WET, so we're bridging wireless to another wireless network. We can extend the distance, so now we can gain access from a different stuff, from a different area, or do karma, some other things we'll get to, and don't know what to do then, and then we can profit from it. So now we don't need ethernet, we just need power. Now we have endless possibilities. How like about an a light socket? What's that? Like an iPhone? Yeah, like an iPhone. <laughs> and if nothing else, we can always power it via battery and stick it in the plant. Okay, so now we've got a couple just for fun. And Dave, you're gonna like this because I told you we were gonna get to this. So we're gonna bridge wireless, we're gonna rebroadcast it for ourselves, take a small battery in some cases, and we turn it into a Goatsy AP. I told you the LaFanera was small, and uh, well, now you're not hiding it on a person, you're hiding it in a person. <coughs> told you, Dave. So how many have heard about the 1960s CIA project called Acoustic Kitty? Acoustic Kitty. <laughs> wow, this is gonna be fun. All right, so in the 1960s, the CIA had a project called Acoustic Kitty, and I have a quote from Victor Marchetti, which I'll read for those guys who can't read it over there, um, that was, they slit the cat open, they put batteries in him and wired him up. The tail was used as an antenna. They made a monstrosity. They tested him and tested him. They found he would walk off the job when he got hungry. So they put in another wire to override that. <laughs> Finally, they're ready. They took it out to a park bench and said, listen to those two guys, those two guys being Russian nationals at the Russian uh, consulate in Washington, D.C., just down the street from the Warman Park Marriott. Um, they take it out to the park bench, listen to those guys. Don't listen to anything else, not the birds, no other cats, no dog, just those two guys. So they have a wireless transmitter in the cat. 
cool. They push the cat out of the van and is promptly run over by a taxi. <laughs> Your tax dollars hard at work. It cost the um, CIA millions of dollars in the 1960s to come up with this project. So I thought, self, if the CIA can do it, so can I. So we have some early field trials of Wi-Fi Kitty. <laughs> No animals were harmed during the course of this experiment. Was because it monitored by PETA? What's that? W was your experiment monitored by PETA? No, but you'll just have to take my word for it. Because if I did anything to this cat, my wife would have killed me and I would not be here. So wait, can you produce a cat today to prove that? Yes, I can. <laughs> Do you have it with you? Not with me, but I can show you pictures. And if you'd like to call and talk to my wife. Sure. Wait a minute, I shouldn't say that, should I? <laughs> But she's going to put the cat Fail. on the phone? Yeah, she'll put the cat on the phone, and no, not like that. All right, so let's bring this full circle for fun. So you remember RenderMan's uh, teddy net? Teddy bear with an access point intended to be given to his friend's young girl? <laughs> yes. That? It was a PETA joke. So the, the teddy bear did finally make it to the little girl. She now is in possession of it. So I thought, sorry, Render. If you can do it, I can do it better. So we take one baby. <laughs> this is my daughter, who's now 10 months. She's three months old at the time. We could take a diaper, an access point, and power. We add the baby. <laughs> Priceless. No is this waterproof? Baby. Yes, she's wearing another diaper. No real babies were harmed during the course of this experiment. So now I tend to find that I, I think about seeing access points all over the place. And I gave this talk really quick at ShmooCon. And uh, Mr. Hoff and our good friend Jack Daniel were across the street at the Irish pub and took this picture. I am not a rogue access point, Larry. <laughs> all right, so now I'm going to turn it over to Rich to talk about his evil twins. So if you think about what Larry's doing, he's hiding rogue access points, plugging them into the local ethernet to be able to capture that data and then sending it out so he can grab it by driving by or whatever else. Well, there's some other kinds of interesting things we can do with wireless access points. And the biggest one, or the one that I like the best, is the evil twin attack. This is basically, if you think about, all right, everybody hold up their iPhones. Oh, come on. How many people have ever taken their iPhone and connected it to an access point called Linksys? Tsunami, default, clear wire, any of those common things. Once you do that, unless it's an encrypted network, it's in memory. Anytime your iPhone gets near any of those again, it's going to go ahead and connect to those again. Or the other thing you can do is, hey, I'm just going to go into a Starbucks and I'm going to set up my evil twin access point. So if I walk in, and I walk in with something that's going to be more powerful than whatever crappy thing that Starbucks has put in, and I say, this is AT&T or T-Mobile, depending on which Starbucks you're going to go into, the odds are people are going to go ahead and connect to me. They've got no idea. They don't think about these kinds of things. And once they connect to me, I have the ultimate man in the middle. I basically have hijacked their entire network connection. I don't have to sniff anything locally or anything else like that. Now, to make them, if they're already connected, make them forced to connect to me, just throw out a bunch of deauth packets that's going to go ahead and knock everybody off, and they're going to have to go ahead and reconnect to you. So what I try to do is take Evil Twin and do it a little bit on steroids. Instead of, uh, lots of times people do this with their laptops. You throw in one or two wireless cards. You can even bridge to the local wireless network or EVDO or something along those lines. Instead, I wanted something I could just kind of make and leave someplace for as long as I needed it to and would maybe go ahead and send me everybody's information back to my house. So what I try to do is go ahead and create something that was self-contained, high-powered, drop it and leave it, and you know, I don't just want to sniff their traffic, I'd kind of like to, like to exploit them anytime they connect into that system. And I can do all sorts of weird exploit stuff. I can go ahead and I can nail them with their browser, with any browser vulnerabilities that are there. I can sniff, do man in the middle traffic. You can run editor cap on these things. You can do almost anything that you need to. Maybe even inject HTML, drop images, imagine airpone for a wired network, those kinds of things. Oh, I get worried when he goes, ah, got it. So, 
I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to do my best attempt to do a demo. Remember, I'm a former Gartner analyst, so the odds of this succeeding are pretty much fucking slim to none. Let me go ahead and get out of PowerPoint here. What I'm going to do is I have a vulnerable virtual machine. Now, this is all wireless, but it's not currently running as wireless right now. I've got it running as wired because Dave and Rob threatened to screw me up with some fuzzing, wireless fuzzing, so I wouldn't be able to do this. It's a blatant lie unless you can produce documentation to support that claim. Yeah. <laughs> so what I've got running over here, I have one virtual machine that is, you know what, let me just switch my display options here. That'll be a little bit easier. Do, do, do. That's Richard's boat, everybody, by the way. Is that the one that Beaker hacked? Yeah. All right, does anybody remember where you clicked the, there we go, mirror displays. <laughs> All right, so what I've got here is one virtual machine. I'm running Core Impact on this one. You can do it with Metasploit. Uh, I actually set this up to run both a Metasploit exploit and a Core Impact exploit on the splash screen, uh, but just to make sure the demo was slightly more reliable, I'm skipping the Metasploit part. This is my unpatched virtual machine. Now, the biggest problem I had with this is this thing is so unpatched, even like half the exploits crashed it completely. Go ahead, run Internet Explorer. So what I've done here is this is the wire connection. It's as if I've already gone ahead and hijacked that wireless connection. I'll show you how I've done that. This is all going to that access point. That access point is set to go ahead and call out when back to whatever computer I'm running, which could be remotely or could be attached into that local network. I'm doing it all locally and wired right now, again, just for demo's sake. All right, so I have my Evil Squirrel Enterprises public wireless access point, and that just crashed because if I switch over into Core Impact, which is this one, you'll see that I now have an agent on this system. And again, you can do this with Metasploit or whatever, and I can go ahead and browse the files and everything else. What I did in this case is the actual splash page itself had those exploits, so I own that system as soon as they connect to that access point and think they're flowing through. Now, I said Evil Squirrel Enterprises. This could, of course, be anything like, um, oh, I don't know, AT&T's page or T-Mobile's page to make it look exactly the same. So the next series of exploits that run, because I don't like to just do just one little thing. I want to make sure that, suppose the browser is patched, there's other interesting stuff I can do. So these next sections are courtesy of our snake. He found all sorts of very interesting URLs and such over on Google and Yahoo and other places that when you connect to them, it's going to go ahead. Not only are you going to be able to sniff cookie credentials and such, but you can get things like my entire Google address book, which is what's showing here. My entire Yahoo address book, which is showing here. And these are the links that are actually embedded in the redirect page. So I hit the splash page, I hit continue, it goes to another redirect page that right now is on hackers.org, but you could actually run locally, we just had a little bit of timing issue. On that page, it kicks these off as, well, they weren't iframes, you use them as image tags, right, in the back end. The user never sees this is happening, and it's making all of these connections to all their sites. And in the process, it's pulling in all of that information. Uh, here's one from maps.yahoo if you have any saved location in maps. Uh, yeah, that's my old address where I grew up. <laughs> um, over here we've got, what's this one? I don't even remember what this one about to come up is. <laughs> it's another Google one. Oh, here's a Google address book. So these are my Google contacts. dmainer at goats.com, hoff at pimps.net, rsnakedevilbastard.com, those kinds of things. So I can take control of anything. Why can I do this? Because they all have their cookies set on their system already. And once they have those cookies and they're logged in, they're maintaining those sessions, I sniff all of that information in the background. Now, the way this is set up on the access point, what I've done, and I'll switch back over to the presentation here. And yes, all of that was running live right now. Those weren't cached or anything else. Whoops, wrong one. Does anybody else love that techno music? Yes. Sweet, sweet satisfaction. All right, let me get it over here so I can hit play again to go through the rest of this. So 
the sequence for the connection is I have the splash page with the exploits. If I don't get them with the exploits, I get the redirect page where I get all of their credentials. If I don't get all the credentials, then I'm capturing all of their traffic because on that access point, I'm running TCP dump and every 30 minutes, it, it writes it all down to local storage and then every 30 minutes, it FTPs that back to my server at home. So I don't have to be anywhere. I can take this and plug it in. And of course, as Larry showed, there's lots of easy ways to hide things. Uh, this one's in those couple of fake books that are sitting on the desk right now. The kinds of things you see in any, uh, say, you know, like internet cafe or whatever where they have the nice lamps and the comfy letter chairs and those kinds of things. Take a lamp, put it on the top, run the cord into the middle, run the cord into the wall, nobody's going to think about it. Now what's inside of this to make it the ultimate evil twin is a couple of things. It's a hacked wort router, which is the big whitish box on the bottom. Coming out of that is the USB storage. That connects to a cradle point router, which is connected up to my EVDO card. The reason I want the EVDO is I want this self-contained. I don't want it to screw with the local wireless. I don't want it to screw with an Ethernet cable going into the wall. I just want this the entire thing to be able to go ahead and run on its own. And connected to that is a 500 milliwatt boosted power. Uh, the average access point, Larry, it's what? It's about 29 to 50 milliwatts, I think. Something like that. Max, m many of them max out no more than 250. This is at 500. And uh, it's got a 7 dBi antenna. And you can put a uh, more powerful antenna on, but I ran out of space. Uh, underneath it is power, so everything's contained when you go ahead and plug it into the wall. And then you can also make it portable. That's a 5-volt battery. I'll pull out of here in a second. Uh, you just connect that up to a car charger, and you just plug everything in, stick it in your backpack, and you're good to go. Uh, this is the one that's been running on here as we've been going along. So, Rich, is I this something with that? E -book? You don't read books, especially books not that big. So something like this 5-volt battery here will run this for about two and a half hours. You take this, the stuff that's in there would actually get a little bit smaller. Stick it in your backpack, you're good to go. Walk into your cafe. You don't even have to have your laptop connected to it or anything else. It's going to sniff all that traffic. Everything it captures, either stored on the USB or send it back over to your home server. So there's some future projects. There are some things I wanted to do with this, but I ran out of time because Dan Kaminsky called me up about a week before July 8th and said, hey, I've got this bug on DNS. I need some help getting the word out. And it really fucked up my schedule and time to build my demo. These things are fully capable of running Metasploit natively on them. Uh, I had a little bit of trouble getting the Ruby libraries and those kinds of things to work, so I just gave up on it. Core Impact actually has a Python agent, and maybe we can talk HD into coming up with a, a Nix-based agent to support, or Metaterpreter that we can go ahead and link in. Fail. Fail, yeah, so we can go ahead and run it. And what that gives you is, one of the things I found is that when you try and turn this into like a VPN server so I can connect into it remotely and do whatever I want, that a lot of that traffic actually gets blocked by Verizon. So if you go ahead and you set it up so it'll actually connect back to you at home and send the traffic across, you'll be able to go ahead and do that. You can do other stuff. Man in the middle it with EtherCap. You can, uh, Carmetasploit is now working with, you don't need to use the Mad Wi-Fi or No, no, they got it to work with the Mad Wi-Fi. I can't remember. Uh, HD made some announcement a few days ago. <laughs> got it. And so what Carmetasploit will do, it's the con combination of Karma and Metasploit where it will accept any SSID probe and anybody will connect into you and then you can run all the Metasploit exploits on it automatically. So assuming we can get the wireless driver set, there's no reason that that can't be running on here. And then you don't even have to fake to be AT&T. You can fake to be, well, it's just going to connect any connection to anything. Uh, the other thing that's not in that is the bridge to the internet itself so the user doesn't realize they've been owned. Yeah, I'm next. Now, why does all this matter? Nothing new here. You guys have all seen this kind of stuff before. It's just combining a couple of simple attacks. It's combining the usual Metasploit stuff or Core Impact stuff with wireless sniffing on the background, with some of the browser-based vulnerabilities that actually pass those credentials across so you can capture all of those things and go. <laughs> and then finally, you can get whatever you want. So that's pretty much all I've got for this section. And turn it back over to Larry to go ahead and plow through uh, the problems with metadata. And I'll, uh, I'll turn the wireless on later, but I didn't want anybody fuzzing it while I was up here or like compromising my access point and fucking up my demo, so. But it's all in here. Pardon me while I whip this out. I gotta go piss. Dave, you're up. Oh, am I up? Sorry. Oh. I was busy. All right, so you know it's going to be a def good DEF CON presentation when it has a farting warthog. Or maybe it's just me. All 
All right, so I've been doing some uh, looking Hold on a second. Now that Rich is gone, we will auction off his wireless gear starting at $20. <laughs> Who has 20 Do I hear $20? 30 Do I hear $30? Anyone $30? 30 40 40 Do I hear 40 40 50 50 Do I hear 50 Oh, okay. 50, 50 is the very minimum we need to get into the strip club. So, Ooh. It's not a nice strip club either. All right, so I've been doing some research into how metadata and some common document types that we can find on web servers out there uh, can lead to getting you owned. So ignore this slide. So what is this metadata stuff? It's uh, some information hidden in files that they've not revealed typically to the user. Um, it's additional data for searches, filing, routing, uh, even for potential file processing. Um, lawyer's office is great for using this for doing uh, uh, content-based searches, those types of things. Um, so if you ever go to the fail blog, you'd know that secret nuclear bunker, this is what's something that should have been some metadata and hidden, but no, it's sitting on the sign. We can find some pretty interesting stuff in here. So let's take a look at some metadata that might get populated in a Word document. And uh, my good friend Paul Asadorian is sort of the butt of this uh, joke. So this is the uh, preference, uh, sorry, the options uh, tab from Microsoft Word on my Mac. And we're filling in a bunch of stuff. Um, my manager is allegedly Paul. Um, it's some potential exploits. And we've got some tests of the emergency metadata system. Um, we also have some page counts and, and word counts and all that good stuff. We can also add custom options. I've included my email and a fake telephone number. So now if we find this document out on a web server somewhere, through Google, whichever, we can run that through strings, ooh, lead, um, and find uh, some concatenated output that includes, thank you, sir. Um, this is a test. This is test made a docu metadata document. Paul is my manager. Um, we also have the version of Word that created it. About halfway down it says Microsoft Word 12.0.1. So you, you used uh, Office on uh, OS X to do this? Yes. Is there, did you find any differences between OS X and Windows? No difference. I did not find any. So one of the other things that can get revealed in some of this stuff is if you edit a document with track changes on and then turn track changes off and publish it, all of those changes get stored in the metadata. So now you download the document, you've got all those changes, and Microsoft actually got bit by this a couple of times, and uh, they had some stuff in there talking about, you know, um, some customers and how they evaluated and what they replaced and that type of stuff. So that may be some handy information for some attackers to know because in one of these instances, uh, it, they said they cra evaluated both and they crossed out 126 Windows 2000 servers. Hmm. Okay, might be helpful to know. How about Adobe Acrobat? So again, here's the uh, options screen for an Adobe Acrobat document. Uh, we've got some information filled in. Um, we can do some more descriptions, uh, my name, what shows up in PDF metadata. And again, we'll be real lead and do a strings on test metadata.pdf that I created and that may be out on a web server somewhere in your organization. So we get a bunch of stuff here as well. We get the uh, distiller that created it, Acrobat Distiller 7.0 on Windows. Um, we get keywords, we get the author, and we get some dates as to when it was created and last modified. Now why is that important? So if I find this document out on a web server somewhere, I know when it was created. I can likely determine when the last time this person updated. So if Rich were to post a PDF document out on his web server that was created two days ago, chances are he probably hasn't chat patched his machine. And if, there's, if this version of Adobe Acrobat is vulnerable, I can deliver him a vulnerability for something that I know that he has on his system right now. Interesting. It's not vulnerable because I use a Mac. <sighs> you should Mr. Know Mogul has had a little bit too much to drink today. <laughs> <laughs> or not enough. All right, so picture this. Uh, this picture was in an AP news story of a hacker named 0x80. Okay. So this was included in a story that he wanted to remain anonymous for. Uh, he admitted to potentially committing some felonies. Um, when it was submitted to the AP, it had some metadata for EXIF and, and a bunch of other stuff in it. Um, it went syndicated. It got left. So if you do a strings on this uh, particular image, which is still via, available via Wikipedia, um, we get some information that it was taken with a Canon EOS 20D. Uh, it was processed with Adobe Photoshop CS2 on the Mac by Sarah Vosen. When it was done, 
and it has some location information. So for someone that wanted to remain anonymous, they gave up his location of Roland, Oklahoma. Is there anyone from Oklahoma here? Who's from Oklahoma? Guess nobody. Oh, great. So that's apparently the reason why, because Roland, Oklahoma is a town of about 2,000 people. What would it take for someone to show up in Roland, Oklahoma, and ask, who's the kid who's about 19 years old, smokes cigarettes, and is into computers? <laughs> Owned. So not so anonymous. So if we can do that, federal authorities can do that, especially when he cops the crimes in a news article. So talk about a couple of tools that I used uh, to come up with some stuff other than the strings, because um, all this stuff is manual download, manual search, and a manual extract. Um, first one I looked at was Gulag which is a cool tool from the CDC. Um, takes all the Google dorks and starts scanning stuff, breaks Google's terms of service. Um, it includes unicorn chasers. However, it wasn't the right tool for this, uh, this application because it wasn't actually looking at any of the metadata. So this one was a fail. So is this gentleman. The image is called militia.jpg. I don't want him in my army. Oh, dear God. There's a series. And why do you know this? <laughs> All as I know is I must possess them. <laughs> All right, so another tool that I uh, discovered was uh, MetaGoofill from Edge Security. It does automated Google queries for common document types, uh, Word, PDF, JPEGs, and so forth. Uh, does automatic uh, extraction and reporting. Uh, picks up user IDs, uh, document paths uh, in some of the older versions of Word, even MAC addresses. So now if you think about that, if you find a MAC address that's uh, for a Dell laptop, uh, what kind of wireless drivers were shipped with a Dell laptop, Dave? Uh, about Broadcom and Atheros. Mine, mine currently has a Broadcom driver. Uh, how about Intel? Is that an option too? Uh, yeah, but you have to pay more for that. Yeah, well, you never know. But so Intel wireless cards in, uh, wireless lap in laptops. Dave, are there any exploits for Intel drivers? There are. There's actually uh, the reason why I'm not on a network here is there's a zero day for Broadcom, and I'm not even trying to take that chance. Exactly. So now you know that there's a Dell machine that processed this particular document through this MAC address that has potentially drivers that are vulnerable to wireless attacks that don't even need to be connected to networks. Okay. That's some information gathering through Google. How about that? Um, there's some problems with this on OS 10. Um, they're working on it. So here's an example of a report. Um, I picked a document from Paul, and uh, it shows that his username is P. Asador. Cool. And it was create one of the documents was created with Adobe, Adobe Acrobat PDF Writer 5.0 for Windows NT. That's old. All right, so let's take all the stuff that we've been talking about and put it together, because this is how you get pwned. It's also similar to something I think I may have seen at the Hacker Pimps party last night, dance fail. <laughs> so I came across this tool called Maltigo. No, not a tasty malt beverage such as this. Um, you may have heard H.D. Moore and Val Smith talk about this. These are the guys that really turned me on to this, and this thing is really cool. So you give it some place to start, a name, a web URL, an email address, and it will go take all of its uh, search type of bits in the background, go through all sorts of social networking sites, um, indexes, um, you name it, it goes and finds it. It will also find documents to extract metadata. So when I'm going through these, I'm going to keep with the theme of this presentation that failure is inevitable. I failed at this because I have information disclosure out there. We'll see. So I did a search on my good buddy Paul Asadorian. And for those of you who can't see it on the far side of the room, uh, I've got a bunch of email addresses. Um, we've got a phone number that actually isn't his. Um, we can see that he's associated with SANS and that another person shows up, Roger Dingledine. So I asked Paul, Paul, why does Roger Dingledine show up? And he told me, well, a couple of years ago I met Roger in Boston and he signed my PGP key. So obviously Paul must trust Roger. So now we have someone whom we can potentially spoof email from. This sounds kinky. Okay, yeah. All right, so now we know someone that Paul apparently trusts that we could potentially spoof email from to Paul and deliver an attack via a document that we know that may be vulnerable. Okay. 
I can't even read this slide, so I don't even know why it's here. Good question. All right, so some of the documents that turned up, we can now use Metagoof, uh, sorry, we can use a Maltigo to pull the metadata out of these documents directly. Right click, there we go. A um, couple of them that Paul had uh, revealed that his username was Piasador. We also note that there's a document linked to Paul's website that has me involved and reveals some information about me. Sexual orientation? Maybe. And the goat. So for that, I give myself a fail. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me cover that up for you. Oh, no, wait a minute, this part. Okay. <laughs> All right, so what do we know about some of this stuff about Paul? <laughs> Dave missed it. Do you want to see it again, Dave? Yeah. He's finally silent. This? <laughs> All right, so what do we know? Paul uses Word, <laughs> and even a possible version with certain time. <laughs> See, I can look down here. He doesn't have to take it off the screen. <laughs> Fail. So Paul uses Word and possible a version with certain uh, vulnerable version within a certain time frame. He creates PDFs uh, with time frames, output DLL, so we know what types of attacks to deliver. Um, we know his email addresses. We know some potential login IDs. Uh, we know what his website is. And we know some people that he trusts so that we can spoof some contacts and send him over some documents. I'm sure we can find some exploits for those. And what is this called? Sexy ladies in leather. Oh, spear phishing. So now we have all the information that we can use just through document metadata to um, conduct spear phishing attacks, as well as some Google searches. Okay, so clean up your act, limit your exposure. Um, if it's on the internet, it's already too late, so fail. At least take care of the stuff that's new. Um, clean up your Office 2003 docs. Um, don't put the metadata in on documents you're publishing on the internet. If you want to use it internally, great, go ahead. Um, just configure Office not to do this to begin with. And uh, you can also use the Microsoft Remove Hidden Data add-on. Uh, works pretty well. Um, you can use some metadata extraction for some other stuff. Uh, Infocrobes, Bachitsu, the Rev, and Hackwire metadata. I haven't had a chance to play with a lot of these, but I'm told they work really well. Um, there's a few available tools for PDFs, too. Um, this particular one is advanced PDF tools. Um, I still need something better because I think this one was a trial version. And I'm not willing to pay for it just yet. Um, JPEGs, great. XF tool is free, runs on our Unix, and it's real easy to remove all the stuff. Okay. Why do we have no more slides? Okay, that's it. Thank you. Hey, before uh, before you go, could you give us some more information about that tool you're using, Montego? I'm sorry. Before you go, could you give everybody some more information about the tool you're using, Montego? Sure. Because I've never heard of it, so I assumed that a lot of people you really. Know, so uh, yeah, quick quick Google search for Maltigo, Maltego, M A L T E G O. Um, you'll turn up the tool, and of course, I can't remember the name of the company that is doing it. Uh, it's by Roloff Temming from South Africa. Uh, Paterva. It's. It's on the Backtrack 3 CD. Uh, Roloff was kind enough to uh, give a license to the Backtrack 3 uh, Backtrack folks to include that. Um, so check it out on there too before you go and download it. It is a pay for tool now. It's still for the type of powerful tool it is. It's very inexpensive. You heard it. Where is the demo? Podcasters Meetup. Okay. Howdy. I'm from the South, and when we get on stage, people in the South, we always say howdy. I, we're wearing cowboy boots, but I'm not quite that gay. Not, not quite. Epic fail. Epic fail. Oh, my window vista screen. Yay. Get my desktop. Awesome. Slideshow. So I, I make a lot of jokes. So yesterday I was I was heckling uh, everybody because yesterday I actually gave a presentation. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna I have to rant a little bit before uh, before we start. I have to rant a little bit before we start because. I, I don't uh, know if uh, everybody might not know. A couple of years ago, I found some uh, problems in uh, Apple computers. And the problem with finding anything in Apple computers is that Apple zealots will then instantly try to tear everything apart. 
So yesterday, because I used an iPhone, and, and the, the general principle was the same kind of stuff Rich and Larry were talking about. You take an iPhone, you put it in a box, and you ship it somewhere. While it's sitting there in somebody's mailroom, because you're supposed to send it to a non-existent person so it doesn't get delivered, somebody opens the box and thinks it's a bomb. So uh, while it's sitting there in the mailroom, generally uh, for pen tests in the past, we've had access to you know, their, their internal network. So using a connect back program on the iPhone, we can actually connect to the iPhone, then use the Wi-Fi interface on the iPhone to attack you know, the network. So you know, I started getting all kinds of hate mail last night that started off with, who the hell would take an iPhone, you just ship them and start using it? You, could, you can just, go right there in the Guinness bottle. The Guinness bottle. Use the bottle. Use the force. <laughs> so, you know, it always annoys me because the, half of the security problems that, that you've seen or talked about today in, in this panel are because people think that they're experts who really aren't. So if, if anyone asks me, I'm not really an expert in anything. Um, but for some reason, I get emails from administrative assistants who are Mac fans telling me why my attack can't possibly work. And that, that's kind of annoying. So I'd like to call upon everybody today to start the cult of the non-Mac user. If you see a Mac user who is professing to be an expert in anything, please hit them with something. <laughs> Preferably their Mac. <laughs> Except Rich. Rich is a good guy. <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, the, the, we'll have that disclaimer then. No pygmy mutilations. So. I have a blog called aretosec.blogspot.com, and I occasionally, before I stopped drinking, would drink something, then get an idea in my head that I could probably do something. At one point, I thought I might be able to be an Olympic athlete in drinking. Um, but a couple of months ago, I was like, I, I can be an artist. I, I read XKCD. I, I can do that. So the, the funny thing about this is that this is my epic fail because apparently I don't do it very well. But this is an actual conversation I've had with somebody. You know, they, they have a bunch of security tools, they run the security tools, and if it's not on their checklist, it's not a problem. So this is, this is my attempt at humor because literally, somebody had an open SMB share that had uh, people saw payroll data on it. So basically, you could connect with no authentication, grab the uh, people soft data, and see what everybody in the company was being paid. And I told the, the CSO this, he goes, well, our, our ISS scans don't show anything. Like, well, that, that doesn't matter. It's, it's right there. He goes, well, according to compliancy, we're compliant. So th this is the kind of stuff that actually really keeps me up at night because these are the kind of people that are protecting you, your enterprise, even your consumer information. No, I, did, I didn't write ISS. No, uh, Chris Klaus wrote ISS. I'm sorry, you, you can get, you just get really sucked in up here with this. So, this is basically uh, what's wrong with security. Everybody here has a web browser, right? Now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you a funny story. Personally, I've been an identity, uh, an identity theft victim twice. The last time was in February where someone, I got a call from my bank on a Saturday morning at like 6 a.m. They're like, excuse me, sir, where are you? And, you know, being the smart ass I am, I was like, I'm in bed. And they were like, no, sir, what, what country are you in? At this point, I'm irate because it's 6 a.m. and I had a hangover. I was like, what country do you think I'm in? You just called me. <laughs> so they, they, they started getting irate with me. And they're like, sir, this is a fraud department. I'm like, oh, crap, what did I do last night? <laughs> so I was like, no, sir, we show you have activity on your credit card in Guatemala. Have you been to any chicken restaurants in Guatemala? And I found this to be utterly hilarious because I didn't know there were specifically chicken restaurants in Guatemala, like Polo, Lioco, or something like that. So the long story, you know, made much short is somebody spent $2,800 for my credit card in five hours on a Friday night in Guatemala. And I can only think, what the hell can you buy for $2,800 on a Friday night in Guatemala? <laughs> Somebody must have had a hell of a good time. So I was like, I'm careful. I, I don't really shop online that much. I, I don't throw receipts away. I shred everything. I follow everything everybody tells me to do. And you know, more to the point, I do this for a living. So I, I know what pitfalls to avoid. How the hell did this happen to me? It happened to me because many people don't know this. I, I actually like guns a lot. So I, 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 uh, I actually build 
custom like long distance shooting rifles and stuff like this. And the site I had bought a custom stock from had apparently uh, been compromised. Visa told me it was a point of convergence. And if anybody know what that means, that, that, that actually doesn't really mean anything. That just means that some fishers were using it to, to verify whether the credit card data was real or not. So I started getting an idea. Um, so I've worked for security companies in the past. I've evaluated almost every security tool. And I'd like to, to take this moment to point out that Chris Hoff is the only person on this panel cool enough to wear sunglasses inside. He is a David Caruso of this panel. <laughs> so if you don't know who David Caruso is, that's freaking funny. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't me. So the point is, is I, 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 I work for security companies uh, that made every kind of security product you can imagine. And th there's one thing that we'd always get done. And I don't know if anybody of you have ever seen a sales pitch from a security company. If you haven't, I highly recommend doing it at least once. It's kind of like getting your penis pierced. You'll do it once and tell your friends about it and never, ever want to do it again. <laughs> so Rich told me that story. How many times have you pierced your penis? Well, me, none, because I'm a chicken. Dave, I can attest to that fact. <laughs> you, you know what, what the problem with a panel like this is? You throw out a joke like that thinking you're just going to go on, and then you, you feel uncomfortable suddenly. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what you said last night. <laughs> to Hoff. <laughs> oh, I, I got nothing. <laughs> I've got nothing. <laughs> Some things are just better left unsaid. So a typical sales pitch from a security company, you know, the sales guy would come in, he's schmoozy, buy low, sell high, don't worry about it, I got a polo shirt, I'm trustworthy. And he'll bring with him a sales engineer. And a sales engineer is a guy that's going to answer all your sales questions. So being, you know, formerly being an engineer in an actual sales company, I look at sales engineers as sales guys that have a sheet with answers on them. Now, if you're a sales engineer and I'm offending you, I am sorry, so you can hide your sheet of questions and answers before anybody sees them and we won't make fun of you. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Howdy. You're actually pretty cute. How are you doing? That's JJ whose shoes I had to carry around Vegas and body Hoff had to carry around Vegas the other night until we got her back in her room. Well, there, wait. I have to be honest. This story sounds far more interesting than this talk. <laughs> wait a minute. There's women at DEF CON? When did this happen? So the, the, point, the point is, and I, I've had to do this before, is they always bring in something that shows you why they're better than competitors. That's why they're there. They're there to explain to you the differences. Otherwise, this could be just like the Amazon of security. You'd be like, oh, you need some IPS? Fortinet's got the lowest price. I'm going to go with them. You know, so what they want to do is they want to explain to you why you're going to pay twice as much for a product that does half as much. So what they'll always do is they'll bring demos with them and say, hey, look at this. This is like the MS-03026 and uh, uh, DC RPC exploit. Tipping point doesn't catch it, but our product does. So what they're not telling you is that someone at some point like me had went through and analyzed all the other competitors' signatures and has come up with a demo that will evade everybody but our product. So, you know, it's, it's kind of disingenuous. I, I have to be kind of honest about that. But so the, the, the point is, is that any, any security product, with, uh, with enough time can catch or fail at anything. You know, so I used to work for ISS and you know, if you spend enough time, you can almost any attack past them. Same thing for tipping point. Tipping point's a little bit easier than ISS, but it, you know, it's still there. <laughs> Three, con you know, all, all these things. So one, one of the problems is uh, you, m most people, like my, my mother, is very unarmed when it comes to the internet. This is. Are, are, we, are we telling mother jokes now? No, just keep going. Wait. Fix your spelling. Oh, I can't spell. That, that's actually my dirty secret. I never learned to read. I, I can read hex, but once I, I translate to hex and ASCII, I don't know what the hell it says. So. <laughs> Rich, how about you have a seat? <laughs> are, are you, are, are. you know it's bad when the analyst is doing tech support. <laughs> So, going back, you know, bringing this full circle to, to the story of how I got owned in somebody in Guatemala, I had a hell of a night at my expense. 
I was thinking, why, why the hell isn't everyone armed? I mean, to be honest, everybody uses a Wild West metaphor for the Internet anyway. You know, I'm sure if you Google Wild West Internet, you'll find nine million stories written by CNET reporters about how the Internet is a wild, wild west and you should buy Kaspersky antivirus or something like that to keep you safe. Say again? Gartner Maybe analysts? even sung by Gartner analysts. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm sure. I do not work for Gartner. <laughs> Anymore. So on Monday of, actually uh, two days from today, Arrest Security, the company I work for, will be releasing a tool. It's basically a toolbar that runs uh, in an Internet Explorer that will actually do a vulnerability scan on every site you surf. And there's a reason for this. I mean, we're not looking for deep inspection stuff like, like arsenic would look for. We're looking for the low-hanging fruit. Like you, you can do easy PHP includes or you're easily susceptible to e SQL injection. The stuff that script kiddies are looking for, and the reason that we're releasing the tool to do this is it's really going to piss every security vendor in the world off. Because what's going to happen is once you start surfing all these sites, all these security tools people have bought are going to light up like Christmas trees because the signatures that are written aren't very good. So everybody that uses this tool and surfs to the site will look like an attacker. Suddenly, Amazon will have 9 million attackers. Well, I'm, I'm not assuming 9 million people will use the tool, but it, it'll start looking like it. So we're going to call it Barrier because I'm, I'm actually a dork and I love ghosts in the show. But uh, so th th this is the actual plan. So the, the, the reason we're doing this is, for some reason, security companies don't think end users should have the ability to determine whether a site is good or not. I mean, even the Google stuff goes, hey, send it back to us. We'll analyze it. And then we'll tell you via toolbar whether it's, it's good or not. I like, I, we'd like to put the, uh, the power to do that into the user's hands. Now, I know this sounds like a bad idea from people who are still trying to find the any key. This might be akin to giving you know, kids AK-47s. It's working out in Kuala Lumpur. I mean, it might work out here. So that's what we're going to do. So I can actually run a demo because somebody here does have... <laughs> Somebody here does have Broadcom Wireless O'Day, and I am not turning on my laptop. No, no, thank you. No, thank you. Oh, no, you can't do it over EVDO. The, uh, the, the interface is different, so you have to just have the adapter. But this is what it looks like. This is what the interface looks like. This is the, so if, you, if you've ever run any of our tools before, you know, I always have, we, we have uh, two other tools called Looking Glass and Axpan. And Looking Glass basically looks and see how, compatible an application is with Microsoft's SDL, and Axpan will actually just go through and look for all the known bad ActiveX controls. Um, so we always have this information screen, and this down here will give you information from us. It'll be a web page. But basically, this is the uh, scan. So you won't actually have to worry about this because this is going to be populated from your address field. But basically, when you run this tool, you'll be running a vulnerability scan on every site you, uh, you visit. And like I said, I attribute this, or I, I, I kind of compare this to arming everybody in the Wild West. Because I really do believe neighbors with guns make good neighbors. So it, somebody likes that idea. Not a, lot of, not a lot of NRA members here, huh? No. no. I'm not going to plug anything you get me in. <laughs> do I look that crazy? So Dave works with Rob Graham, who uh, came up with Hamster and Fair with the sidejacking <laughs> tools. And it took about... How many, uh, nine months before you stopped using your Gmail when Rob was sitting across the table? No, no I, I have actually stopped using Wi-Fi altogether. It's kind of like heroin. I went cold turkey. I don't even use Wi-Fi in my home anymore. I have a, 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 a built-in HSTPA card, but for some reason, Christopher Hoff killed my HSTPA card with those sunglasses. So... Uh, that's basically uh, my portion of the presentation, aside from the heckling, is that on Monday, if you want, you'll be able to download a toolbar. So to answer a question before anyone asks, we decided to do it as a toolbar because we want to be able to evaluate SSL data as well after it gets rendered. So we need access to the DOM, and we didn't really want to do it in such a way that it's a, it's a proxy. And right now, it's, it, it is just Internet Explorer only, so if you're a Firefox fan, you're probably safe anyway. Or Safari. So, without further ado, I will turn this back over to Mr. Mogul, who I want to capture after this and make him tell me where the pot of gold is. Does anybody ever think Pokemon? Pikachu! I'm a leprechaun, dude. Come up with a good one. 
Short, red hair, look like I'm Irish Jewish, but I married an Irish chick, so it works out. <laughs> you didn't tell us you were going to have clip art, man. Okay, we've got about 10 minutes left for Q&A. Look, we've covered a lot of different things today. We've roamed all over the map. And to be honest, a lot, some of that was trying to figure out how the fuck we could put all this stuff together into one panel and have a little bit of fun. <laughs> we, we failed. And we probably utterly failed. But I think the goal of this is a lot of the things we show are simple. You know, you take this grid app thing that's supposed to be this incredibly hard, convoluted, mathematical impossibility, and our snake cracks it in like two minutes by hand on stage with the short password and when long passwords make it easier. And really bad keynote skills. And that's because our snake is a pimp. Do not give me crap for my keynote <laughs> skills. We had to convert his stuff from PowerPoint. Uh, you know, Larry learned how to hide things in his baby, which we are worried <laughs> in about. In most states, that would get you arrested, so. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a question right there. Shout it out. So his question was, because we're recording this, doesn't the tool make you, Dave, look like a hacker or whoever's using it to the site? You yes, like but there, there's, a, there's a method to this madness. In reality, before you leave home, you, 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 know, you lock your door and you check it to make sure it's locked. Uh, you know, if, if you walk up to a business and you, you know, they're closed and you try to open the door, the door's locked. You, you, you by default, have interrogative techniques to, to, to know if the places you are safe. For instance, if you're going to a strip club and there's guys with guns outside, it's probably not a strip club you want to go to. I use a lot of strip clubs in my metaphors. So the problem is, is that in the Internet... Uh, has become a place where any activity to determine whether you're safe or not looks bad. And this is because security companies are very lazy and they want to write generic signatures to cover a wide range of attack. So yes, you will look like an attacker. Yes. Yes, you would look like an attacker to your own bank. The problem is, is that as more people use tools like this, uh, the profile of what an attacker is has to change. The, the, the three people who are going to use that tool. <laughs> my, my mom's going to use it. <laughs> yeah, Dave, Rob, and Dave's mom. <laughs> we had all In fact, three. my mom's been using it for quite some time. She just doesn't know it. All right, any other questions? <laughs> this is a long one. We feel uh, we thank you for staying through it when we're drinking and leaving to go to the bathroom and you didn't. What? What? All right. That's gone way too far. I'm sorry. Thank Mr. you all for joining us today. We're going to get the hell off this stage. Bye, and enjoy the rest of DEF CON. <laughs>